Yes. Okay. So, welcome to lesson five. Uh, today we're going to be learning about sort and search algorithms. Uh, sorting in Java. So, what is sorting, right? So, sorting is usually defined as placing elements in a specified order. Uh, data type ordering, int long short, increasing numerical order. So, like, you can sort them by, like, how big they are as numbers. So, one, two, five, seven, etc. For strings, you can uh, put them in lexicographic order. I don't even know if I pronounced that right. Locate the first character that is different in two strings, and then compare them uh, with the ASCII values of the characters. A is the smallest, and capital Z is the biggest, but I guess that's a typo. Uh, how to sort. So sorting an array, you can import uh, java.util.arrays, and then you can just sort, and then the array name in there. So on the right, uh, you can see that over here, we declare the array, we sort the array, we print it out, and we'll get 02469, right? Because it sorts them in uh, increasing order. I forgot the, in ascending order. <laughs> sort an array. So you can sort array lists, which is uh, java.util.arraylist. It's a list. Uh, the, you can use java.util.collections to sort the list, and it will do the exact same thing as how you would sort uh, an array. So trying it out, this is just two links that link to the code. And this is some sorting practice. So you have a literal just sorting. I don't know if you can see this, but I hope you can. And my computer is dying which is just called sorting, and then it's a basic sorting uh, sorting problem, uh, right? Yeah, it's basically then, like, if you, if you just look at the previous slide, you already have the answer. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, basically. And then these are medium ones, some of them are CCC questions. These, uh, this is an S2, but... Uh, and then there's lazy loading, which is probably really annoyingly hard. So more complicated sorting. Uh, there... <sighs> Rule, display the usernames of people by descending amount of points. And if they are tied, sort their usernames alphabetically from A to Z. How can we do this? Right? Because now you're taking into account the number of points and their name. <laughs> oh, you want me to take, okay. Albert has the most points. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> he so, is Albert fan club simp. <laughs> yeah. Um. Wait. Let me screen share. Uh. Sure. Stop share. Okay. Hey. Okay. So we're given this kind of leaderboard with all these points and we want them to sort by um, increasing, decreasing number of points. And then if they're tied, then we want to sort them by the name. So we have, we have um, more than one criteria here. So that's what makes it really complicated. So let's see how we can do this. We can use something called comparable, which is a really nice tool that Java gives us. So how can we do this? So, um, Let's see, first you have to create a class. Uh, actually, I'm going to do this on Replit so that you guys can see it better. Um, oh, okay, I'll just do it here. So anyways, when you're creating, a, you have to create a class and the class is basically a blueprint of a custom data type. So you already learned about int, you learned about long, you learned about Boolean, and these are all like data types that Java gives you by default, right? Um, but in certain situations, you want to create your own data type. Like you want to store more than just an int or a string. I mean, you want to store both an int and a string and you want them to be like linked to each other, right? So this is when a class would be useful and the class would contain all the variables that you need for sorting. So in this case, your class
class will contain a username and your class will include a score. So this is how we can make a class within a class, right? So you would just say static class. You can give your class a name. I called it a pair because it's holding two pieces of data. And this is really important. You have to say implements comparable. So you have to add this to the class. So static class pair implements comparable. And within the brackets, you would put the name of that class. So what this lets you do is um, when you are using arrays.sort, which you learned before, it will know to look inside this class and that you're telling it that you have a custom sorting function. So implements comparable pair. And here you would declare the names of the data that you want to use. So string name and int score, right? So these are going to be um, parts of a pair, right? And this is something that's called a constructor. It tells the program, it tells Java um, how to create a pair. So um, you have to pass in a string name and an int score. And you will need to assign it by using this.name equals name and this.score equals score. So as you can see here, we're creating a new pair by passing in a string and also passing in an int, right? So this is consistent with how we've defined a constructor, which is you have to pass a string and you have to pass an int. And the reason why we use this is because there's two names, right? There's one that you passed in your constructor and there's one that's declared outside the constructor. So this tells the program to look on the outside. Don't look inside the constructor, look on the outside and assign this name to be this name, right? And you assign this score to be this score, right? So um, that's how you can create a pair. Um, you would declare the data types that's inside the pair. Um, you would tell the program how to create your pair. And this is the most important part. You have to tell the program how to sort your pair, right? Because if I tell you to sort an integer array, well, that's pretty easy. Like your program knows to default sort it from smallest to largest, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. But if you want to tell your Java program, hey, I want you to sort a pair, like your Java program is going to be like, what is a pair? I've never heard of a pair before. So you have to tell it how to sort your pair, right? Um, because your program is not smart like a human. You have to tell it to do how to do everything, right? So you would do public in compare to, and you have to name it compare to because um, it's part of comparable. So you can't change the name. You have to name it compare to and uh, pair other. So you would pass in another pair, right? So um, you won't actually call this directly. When you're doing arrays.sort, it will use this function to help do its internal sorting process. And it would return an int. So the thing is, this compare to function will return a negative number uh, when you're telling the program, hey, I want this pair to go behind this pair, right? So your compare to will return negative to tell the program that 01 goes before 02, where you're calling the function on 01 and you're passing in 02, right? So for example, here I do integer.compare score um, comma other score is greater than zero. So that means this compare function will return a negative if this score is less than the other person's score. And um, it will return a positive number if this score is greater than the other score, right? So right now I'm doing the reverse. So if, if it's a positive number, you return a negative number. If it's a negative number, you want to return a positive number. So this basically um, kind of goes in reverse, right? Because we want it to be descending amount of score. And this else is called when the score is the same, right? And it, when the score is the same, we want to compare the strings of the names, right? So that's when we use the name dot compare to other name. So this would return negative one if this person's name is alphabetically smaller than the other person's name. It will return one or like a positive number if this person's name is alphabetically greater than the other person's name. So negative one means that this pair is goes before it. And if you uh, return a positive number, it means um, it should go after the other pair, right? It's kind of like 
very confusing, but hopefully you'll get a grasp of it. So this is where you're telling the program how to sort your pair, right? And this stuff is all pretty self-explanatory. Um, you need a scanner and you read the number of names in the leaderboard. Uh, you, re you read the person's name, you read their score, and then you can create a new pair like this. And you would assign it to leaderboard at I. And you notice that we're using the pair data structure here. Um, like the pair um, class, so that we can call it pair leaderboard equals new pair. And then just like a normal array. And then you can sort it. And when you sort it, it'll call this function to tell it um, how it should sort it. And then you can just print out the name and the score. All right. Um, actually, I feel like, uh, let's see. I think there's a simpler way to do this. I'll just code it out. Sorry, it wasn't that clear. So I'm just going to create. Um, here, remember, um, we're reading, we need a, we need to import um, java.util.scanner. And then you can create a scanner, uh, input equals new scanner system.in. And then you have to read in the number of numbers in the leaderboard, right? So we would use input.nextint. And then we can do a for loop and Right. And then you can read in the person's name, right? So input.next, and you can read in their score, input.nextint. So hopefully you still remember how to read input. And then now um, you would put it into a pair. So you can create a pair array, right? Let's call it ARR, new pair, n. So right now this, this array is practically empty. Like you wouldn't be able to call ARR at zero because it wouldn't have anything in it. So what do we need to do? We, well, we need to initialize it. So equals new pair and then pass in the name and the score. So does this make sense? You're just reading the input, right? You're just reading in the number of names and then you're reading in the name and then you're reading the score using a for loop. So that's pretty self-explanatory. And then we go back to this part, um, static class, Let's call it um, student right now, okay? Just to spruce things up. And remember, you have to do implements comparable. So this means that, well, you're gonna define like a custom sorting thing in your class. All right, and then you remember um, there's a string name because we wanted to um, store that information. And a student also has a score. And then remember, we have to define how we create a student. So if we want someone to create a student, we want their name, we want their score. Oops, this is not Python. And then we would assign their names and we are assigned their scores. Okay. And then now we have to define the custom sorting function, which is called compare to, compare to pair other. Right, so we want it to be in the sending order, right? So let's say, let's create an if statement. So if the, if the this pair score is greater than the other person's score, then what do we do? Well, if this person's score is greater than the other student's score, if this person's score is greater than the other person's score, right? We want it to come before them. So we return negative one. Because remember, we're sorting in descending order. So we want the larger numbers to come first, and we want the smaller numbers to come after. So if this person's score is greater than the other person's score, then we have to return negative one, because we want the greatest score to come before the smaller scores, right? 
So does everyone get how that works? Oh, the implements comparable stuff. You don't need to know how that works. Um, I believe it's an interface that you can use, but we're not going to go into the specifics of that. Yeah, basically. So um, let's use another if step statement. So else if score is less than other dot score. So what this means is that this student's score is smaller than the other person's score, right? And what will we do? We will return one. And why do we return one? It's because if this person's score is smaller than the other person's score, we want it to come after that student, right? Because we want the smaller numbers to come later and we want the bigger numbers to come first. So that's why we have to return a positive number to mean that this person, this student is gonna come after the other student who has a larger score. So that's why we have to return a positive number. And what does this else case mean? This else case means that this person's score is equal to the other person's score, right? We have greater, we have less, then else means equal. So what do we do? Well, we can use something called, um, we can call that strings compared to method, right? So um, we can return name dot compare to other other dot name. So like this looks pretty cool because a string in fact is an object in itself and a string has its own compare to method. So if we say that their scores are equal, we want to compare them by their names, right? So we can just do name dot compare to other dot name. And this will give us the default sorting for a string, which is from alphabetically least to alphabetically greatest. So basically from A to Z, right? So we can call the strings compared to method. And this would, this would sort from A all the way to Z. And here it means score is greater comes before, right? Score is smaller comes after. And here, you're just sorting from A to Z by using the strings compared to method. Yeah. So it sounds really complicated. Does everyone understand how this compared to method works? Negative, negative one means comes before, right? One means comes after. Score is greater, it comes before, so negative one. Score is smaller, comes after, positive one. Um, equal, compare them by their names. And this goes from A to Z. If I want to go from Z to A, guess what I do? I just put a negative sign before it. Because when you do it, the negative sign, it goes in reverse. So yeah, that's how we can do this. And let's try that out. So we can just call the arrays.sort, but first we need to import the arrays. And then we sort it, array.sort ARR. Well, how does your computer know how to sort ARR, sort array of pairs? It will look at the compare to method, which you have defined. So um, you don't have to do anything except just do this normal arrays.sort method. And then we can iterate through the array using a simple for loop and print out the results, um, which is arr.i. Well, how do we access the student's name? You use the dot. So you use dot name, and then you can leave a space, and arr.i, how do we, how do we um, get the score? We use the dot, the dot score. So this gets the student's name and this gets the student's score, right? And then we can try this out. We do the, I don't think it, I don't think it slows down the performance. Um, at least not by a lot. Um, I do have to mention that you can try using an array list instead and it'll actually be faster than using an array. When you're sorting objects, um, array lists could be a little bit faster than arrays. 
Um, but just for our purposes, for demonstration, I have used an array. So let's try it out. Oh, wait. Did I do? Oh, I named it pair. It should be student. Yeah, I got too used to using pair, you know, but it has to be the same name as the class. So let's try it out. So let's say we have what? Three people. Miss Albert. This was a lot of score. Um, we have Jake, who also has a lot of score. Oh, wait. Make it a little bit smaller, and Ryan has 4,000. Okay, let's sort it. All right, so you see it works. Albert's first, Ryan second, Jake is third, right? But let's try, uh, let's try to see what happens if we have a tied score. So this is where we can show the power of this. So let's say we have uh, Ryan that has um, 9999. We have Jake who has 9999. And we have Albert that has 9999. Well, guess what? Because everyone had the same score, then they would start sorting by the names, right? And A comes before J, and J comes before R. Um, yeah. Oh, Xiao, um, do you have a question? No? Okay, great. So just make sure you review this, um, this fact that you can use the compare to to do some custom sorting. And now that you know how to sort by um, two values, you will know how to sort by three values, by four values, by five values, whatever it is. So yeah, so this can be, become very useful when you're sorting data by multiple criteria. All right, let's go back. So here are some comparative sorting practice problems. Um, we're running low on time, so I'm just gonna leave them for you to do. Uh, yeah, so please try them out. And a searching algorithm. I want you guys to play this game. Um, I spent a lot of time to make it, so I would really appreciate it if you guys play it. Um, it's written using Python, but I will explain the code later in Java. Oh wait, no. I did it again. So your instructions for the game is that you have to guess a number from one to 100 and the computer will tell you if the secret number is higher or lower than your guess. And you will repeat this until you guess the right number. And your goal is to guess the least number of times. I'm gonna give you um, around like four minutes maybe for you guys to try this out. And uh, when you come back, I want you to tell me um, around how much tries you got before you got the answer. Yes, Mr. Cohen talked about this before. Uh, let's see if you can apply the strategy um, to play this game in the shortest number of times. Yeah, don't, don't. No, no, no reveal. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Albert search. Yes. So every single time you get like a number of tries, just put it in the chat and then let's discuss about this. Nine? Hey, that's pretty good. Is the number 69? Well, oh, oh, oh okay. Um, the number is randomly generated for every single person and every single time you play it. Eight, three, three, okay, nice. It could be, I mean, I use a random number generator, so. Okay. 
Okay, not bad. You guys are getting very uh, low number of tries. Six. Yeah. Okay, let's look for a couple more. Seven. Nice job. Let's see if you guys can consistently get low scores. <laughs> nice. Never knew anyone who got negative before. It's amazing. Eat again? Yeah. If you can consistently get low number of tries, it probably means you have a good strategy for this game. Okay, three more people. I want three more people to tell me their scores and then we can move on. Five, mm -hmm. four, yeah, one more. Okay, I think that's enough actually. All right, so can someone tell me what was your strategy when you were playing that game? Let's put it in the chat. Star 50, right? And then what, what do we do afterwards? One half, great. All right. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you guys kind of got the strategy here, right? Yeah. Kevin, you're right about this. Just keep halving the distance. And then you get the signal, whether it's lower or higher, and then you divide it again, right? So, wow, you guys are really smart. You got this the first try around. Like, it took me a long time to understand this. Um, so, yeah, Hank's um, solution is kind of along the same lines, right? So first of all, let's talk about the naive strategy. So this strategy ensures that you're never going to repeat a number twice, right? And what would you do? Well, you'll just get in the program and say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, right? This is like a really naive strategy. Um, and it'll take you 100 tries if the number is 100. So if you're really unlucky, well, this is your bad day. You have to try a hundred tries. So is there a better strategy? Well, you guys proved that yes, there is a better strategy. And let's look at it. So this is the optimal strategy. You guess the middle. And if the secret number is lower, then you only look at the lower half. And if the secret number is higher, then you only look at the upper half. And then you would chop it in half again. So let's say my my secret number was like 70, 75, let's say. So what would I do? Well, I'm gonna guess 50, right? And it says my number should be higher. Then I would only consider 50 to 100 and I chop in half again um, to check 75 and that was the right answer. So I only need two guesses, right? Um, and then you can see an example on the right. So it says, guess a number and 50, right? Go higher. And I chop it in half again. So I say 75. Uh, and then it says go higher. So I know the number is between 76 and 100. I chop it in half again, 88. And it says go higher. Well, it can only be from 89 to 100. Chop it in half again, guess 94. Go higher, chop it in half again, 97. Chop it in half again, 99. And then you'll end up with the right answer eventually. So um, in this game, your guaranteed solve is within seven to eight guesses when you're playing this game. And if you've learned like advanced functions before, you know um, what seven to eight guesses out of a hundred means. Like it's called something called log base two of n, if you guys done math before. But basically it just means that how many times do I have to multiply two by itself to get the size of the array, right? So like two to the two to the power of what equals 100. And then, so two to the X equals 100. So X would be the number of tries that you have to do before 
you get the answer. So it's actually really efficient. Like if I give you like something like a couple billion, you only need like 16 tries, right? If it's a sorted array um, of like numbers and you want to find a number, I only have to guess 16 times. So it's like crazy. And why is it base two? Well, you're chopping it half in half. Three, um, three might be faster, but two is easier to code. And also it minimizes your worst case scenario. When we're talking about algorithms, we always want to focus on the worst case scenario. Um, so when you're chopping in half, your worst case scenario is minimal, right? I don't know how to prove that, but um, if you're chopping it in three, right? If you chop it at 33, for example, well, what if it's higher? Then you have to consider 34 to 100 and your worst case becomes a lot worse than when you're chopping it in half. So if you want the best worst case scenario, then you would use binary search. Well, how can we use this um, strategy beyond this guessing numbers game, right? Well, this can be applied when searching for the index where an element can be found in a sorted list. So let's say I have an array of these numbers over here. Um, I have these numbers over here and I wanna find a specific number. So what can I do? Well, I can use the same strategy and you can look at this animation to see how it's done, right? So if 37 was the right answer, well, um, we would chop that array in half because it's sorted already, right? And then you can decide whether it's higher or lower based on an if statement and you chop it in half and then you chop it in half again and then you'll end up with the right answer. So that's how binary search works. Um, you're kind of like that guessing game, but when it tells you higher or lower, you can determine that using an if statement. And then you can adjust the left side and the right side appropriately to um, find that element. And then it's a lot faster than this sequential search, which is to actually go from bottom to high. You're not using the fact that the list is sorted. So yeah, that's how binary search works. And this is the code for binary search, right? So I have a variable holding the left side and I have a variable holding the right side. So this is the interval that I have to consider. So right now, if I want to guess where five is in the array, well, um, where can it be? Well, it can be the first element and it can also be the last element as well. I have absolutely no idea where five is. So I have to consider the whole range. It can be zero or it can be the last number or it can be anything in between. So let's calculate the middle. So I take left side plus the right index divided by two. That gives me the middle index, right? So while left is less than right, so this is kind of abstract, but I'll explain this later. You would do if the element you're considering right now, if your middle is equal to X, right? Which means you already found that element, then you would print it out and you would leave the main function. If it's greater, well, if your element is greater, then I would, oh, if your, wait, let me see. Yeah, oh, okay. So um, if your middle element is greater than the element that you're trying to find, well, you will move the right side to mid minus one. And if your element that you're trying to find is greater than the middle element, then you would move L to mid plus one. And then you would do this again. So you would just loop it and loop it and loop it until you find that correct element. So let's do an animation to show you what I mean by this. So right now, that five can be anywhere within this array. We have no idea, right? The only reason why you know is because you use your eyes to scan this array in sequential order. So, okay, so let's try to find five within this mysterious array. Let's consider the middle, so the midpoint. Well, is five greater or smaller than four? Well, five is greater. So I only have to consider this section, right? We don't, I don't have to care about this section because we know that it's in sorted order, so it can't be zero, one, or three here. So let's consider this section and let's split it in half again. Well, is five greater or smaller than eight? 
Well, five is clearly less than eight. So we only have to consider the left side of eight, which leaves me with this element. And then we check the middle, which is itself. And we found the right answer. So this is how you can do binary search. You would, to specify the interval that you need to find that five, you would use L and R, right? So right now L is at zero and R is at six, right? And you would check the middle element, right? And you would move it to mid plus one, right? And then you check the middle element again. Well, you would move the right, right index, which is at six to four, which is mid minus one. And then you would check the final element, which gives you the right answer. So this is how you can do binary search. You will keep on guessing the half, right? And seeing if it's higher or lower. And then you would make the interval smaller. And then you'll guess the middle of that interval. And you would determine if it's higher or smaller. And your interval would get smaller and smaller over time. And you'll eventually have the right answer. So that's how you can do binary search. And these are some binary search problems. Um, there's actually a lot more, but I just haven't had the time to find it. But do try these out. And that's the end of today's lesson. Um, before you guys go, I want to show you how you can use Replit to solve CCC problems, because I think that's really important. Um, so let's say um, I want to submit a problem, right? So. Let's say I wanted to submit my multiplication table. Okay, let's just say this was my solution for a CCC problem. Okay, so how can I do this? Well, um, so first, what I would do is you look at these three dots over here, you'll press it, and it says download as zip, and you want to press that. So it downloads my multiplication table. Um, so I can open it up in my file opener downloads, and I can find my multiplication table. And inside it, I have my .java file. This is what you would submit to the CCC grader. You're not copying and pasting like Dmosh. You have to submit a file. Um, I'm going to see if any questions. Oh, wait, I'm not sharing it. OK, um, I'm going to screen share the whole thing. Then. You guys see it now? Yeah, OK. So it went into my downloads folder. You might have to go look for it. And then what I do is I click into it and you see your .java file, right? You bring it out back into downloads. So I already have a name .java, so I'll just replace it. So this is the file I want to submit to CCC grader, right? When I'm doing the CCC. So what do I do? Well, I would go to the CCC grader. Um, Let's see, I need to find the right tab. Um, so I would go to the CC grader, right? Um, I'm just going to log out so that I can show you the login process. Uh, I can send you guys the link. So you go here, and once you've signed up for an account, you can enter your username. You can enter your password and you can press login. And here are all the contests that are previous in the CCC. You can also find these problems on Dimash, but when you're doing the CCC, it's going to be on this platform. So um, at least try it out once just to get a hang of it. And you want to find something that's called post contest. So this allows you to submit your solutions to problems that have already been posed in previous contests. So let's say I wanted to solve a junior problem. So I go here. And let's say my solution was to um, epidemiology. So what would I do? I would select epidemiology, select my Java, my language, which is Java, and I would submit my file. So I would submit main.java and then press submit and it will grade your solution. And this is obviously wrong because I submitted a multiplication table to a random CCC question. But if you've done it right, it will grade your answer, right? And as expected, I got wrong answers. <laughs> so I encourage you guys to try this out. You'll go to Replit, download a zip, take the file out of the zip, um, 
and then go to CCC Grader, log in, and find the contest, and choose the right problem, choose your language, choose your file, and then submit. So this is the entire process. So do you guys know how to submit it now? It's a little different from Beamlash. Because now you have to save your replet code as a file, and you'll have to upload the file to their website. All right, so I think that concludes our lesson for today. It's already past time. Um, you can stay behind if you have any questions. Uh, otherwise, um, we'll see you next week. Bye.